At the end of World War II, over one million refugees, including concentration camp survivors, political prisoners, resistance fighters, and Nazi collaborators, were left with no home to return to. The fate of these people over the next 30 years is the subject of acclaimed historian David Nassau's The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War. It's an incredible history of an overlooked people that continues to shape the current global attitudes toward refugees. David Nassau is an award-winning biographer, historian, and the Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. Distinguished Professor of History at Cooney Graduate Center. A two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, Nassau is the author of best-selling biographies of Andrew Carnegie and Joseph Kennedy. For today's conversation, Nassau is joined by John C. McManus, Curator's Distinguished Professor of U.S. Military History at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. McManus is the author of 13 critically acclaimed books of military history with a focus on World War II. Island Infernos, the second volume of McManus's trilogy on the U.S. Army Crusade in the Pacific, will be published in November 2021. Library and AGC Media. I am extremely honored uh, to speak with Dr. David Nassau today, author of The Last Million, Europe's Displaced Persons from World War to Cold War. You've spent most of your distinguished career as a biographer, most notably writing biographies of Carnegie and Joseph Kennedy. I wondered how you got interested in this particular topic. What brought you to that? Part of what happened when I was writing my biography of Joseph Kennedy, I was very much affected by the stories of the immediate post-war period. What I wanted to look at in particular was what I thought was a, was a hidden chapter in the post-war period, in the beginning of the Cold War and in World War I. And that was the story of the last million. There are a million refugees who are left behind in Germany, slightly smaller number in Austria, some in Italy. When the war is over, most of them, the majority had been brought into Germany as forced laborers or slave laborers. The Germans with their huge military force in the East had no one left at home to bring in the crops and run the railroads and the factories and munitions plants. So they brought in millions, literally millions of Eastern Europeans. There were, I think, close to 2 million um, Western European prisoners of war who were put to work in Germany. At the end of the war, there were hundreds of thousands of collaborators, of people who had worked for the Germans in Eastern Europe, and who when the war was over, knew they were gonna be punished when the Soviets returned. So they fled into Germany. And then there were the Jews who were stuck, who had lived the last, months of the year in uh, concentration labor camps. As Americans, we tend to, to think of VE Day as this triumphant narrative and the war's over, we've won. And you know now we move on to this incredible post-war future and all the, you know, and obviously the Cold War sets in and all that. But for most Europeans, the struggle in some ways is just beginning. Um, you know, you have a continent that's been laid waste. Here are these allied soldiers almost all of whom have been trained for combat operations and their commanders. And, you know, they're having to transition to occupation duty, but then they've got this huge humanitarian crisis on their hands and no one more so than the Americans who have greater responsibilities than the others, it seems. So, so you know, what kind of challenges are, are these soldiers facing at that stage? The soldiers were, were miserable. All they wanted to do was to go home. 
They didn't want to serve in an occupation force. They, they talked about um, being babysitters. In the beginning, Eisenhower, who was the supreme commander in Europe, and then the head of the occupation army, he, he can't pay attention. He's more worried that there are going to be German who are going to, uh, what are they, you're the military historian, what are they called? Werewolves. Werewolves. Yeah. yeah. Werewolves. They're going to come out of the of the forests or out of, and start sniping at American soldiers. So so he's worried about that, and, and rightfully, he should have been. Um, w- what happens is that the Jewish refugees are rounded up by nationality. The American forces and the British don't recognize Jews as a separate entity. So if you're a Polish Jew, you're Polish, according to the American army, and you're stuck into camps with Polish non-Jews. The same with the Latvians and the Lithuanians. And that for the Jews was intolerable because they knew that among them, certainly for the Ukrainians who survived, that the their neighbors in these camps might have been the guards in the death camps or might have been the killers of their families or the looters of their businesses back in Poland. Plus, when the, when the Jews come out of the last million, they are the sickest. They are the most damaged. Truman has been told over and over again that there's a problem, that there's a problem with these million refugees. And he sends a representative to look into the situation of the Jews. And that representative, Dean Earl Harrison, who had been a law professor and the head of the law school at University of Pennsylvania. Harrison says, we're treating the Jews as bad as the Germans did, except we're not exterminating them. We're putting them behind barbed wire. We're not letting them out. We're not letting anybody in. They're starving. They can't practice their religion. Truman immediately writes Eisenhower. Eisenhower says, I'll look into it. Eisenhower goes and he visits the camps. He visits the camps. And he immediately tells his commanders, I want you to make sure that these people are well taken care of, that they get extra rations, that we remove the armed guards, let them police their own camps that we get Yiddish speakers in there as liaisons with the army. It's a remarkable moment. It struck me as sadly ironic, you know, the allies having liberated so many of these folks um, and in relation to the Jewish DPs, they want to treat them like equals, like, like everybody else that, you know, in other words, they don't want to single them out the way the Germans had and their other, the other perpetrators of the Holocaust. They want them to blend in with everybody else. But in doing that, that becomes a form of discrimination in the sense that, like you said, David, uh, they, they may be in these DP camps with the very people who were perpetrating against them. Yeah. Um, and of course, they're, they're in a special category because they had been singled out by the Nazis and because, as we'll explore, so many wanted to go to Palestine. You know, So you know, in a way, it's, it's counterintuitive that in order to treat Jewish DPs better, the, the allies had to then single them out again. Um, you know, and so Eisenhower is confronted with this in a way. And it's, so it's really one of the things that, you know, having studied Eisenhower, you know, very in depth for much of my career, one of the things that stood out to me was that we think of Eisenhower as the commander of Operation Overlord and the Allied Forces and winning the military victory, and of course later as president. But this is this brief moment in his life when he's overseeing, in some ways, his toughest mission, the occupation, before he becomes Army Chief of Staff. So I'm very intrigued by your your assessment of him. You know, how, how do you how do you see him? Uh, you know, how do you think that that he did in, in relation to dealing with these problems? I think he was remarkable. Compare him to Patton. Patton is with him on these visits, and at one point he visits one of the Jewish camps and he celebrates Yom Kippur. He goes into this makeshift synagogue, sits through the service to show solidarity with these people, comes out. Patton writes in his diary, what the hell does Eisenhower think he's doing? These people 
smell. They're, they're less than human. I've never been in a place so horrible. You know, I, I lost my lunch afterwards. And Eisenhower, you know, this the supreme commander feels an, an empathy um, with Polish Jews. Um, they don't speak the same language. They come from, God, from Abilene, Kansas to Luzh, Poland. Can you think of two more distant places, culturally, geographically, in every way? But, but Eisenhower gets it. And, and the British are furious with Eisenhower and Truman. The British say, how dare Eisenhower and how dare Truman single out the Jews for special treatment. Um, and it's Eisenhower and Truman, not the labor government in Britain that understands the plight of the Jewish displaced person. The labor government is enraged and they say, why the hell do we treat the Jews any differently? Everybody suffered during the war. Let them wait online. Why do they try to get to the front of the queue? And, and Truman and Eisenhower say no. And Truman and Eisenhower, Eisenhower agrees with Truman, that the only solution to the problem of the Jews is to get them the hell out of Germany and the displaced persons camps into Palestine which of course enrages the British even more. All right, so there we have the crux of a major problem, obviously reverberations that are still with us today. So what's the issue there? Why are the British so adamantly opposed to this? What are they, why, and why do the Jews want to get to Palestine? The, the Jews want to get to Palestine, some of them because they've always been Zionists, but that's the minority. A large number of the Jews want to go to the United States, or they want to go to Canada, or they want to go to Australia. Um, but the Americans won't let them in. And the Canadians only let in a small number. The Canadians are better than the Americans. And the Australians let in a tiny number. Um, so the Jewish DPs recognized very early on that the British say, go home. And the Jews say, what are you, you, know, are you kidding? How can we go home and live in communities by ourselves knowing that those communities have participated in one way or another? They either sat back and let the Germans destroy us or they helped the Germans destroy us. No, we can't go home again. We have no home. Except Palestine. Palestine was the only place that, that welcomed them. And large numbers of Jews felt that they had no choice in the matter. The, the greatest irony, and, and you know, it's, it's an unspeakable, tragic irony, is that the Jews who get to Palestine, one quarter to one third of them are immediately put into the army. And a large number of them don't survive the War of 1948. And those who do survive are given homes in cities, in towns, in settlements, in the rural areas. They're given homes that had been abandoned by the Palestinians. So in order to solve the only solution to the Jewish displaced persons problem is to create half a world away a Palestinian displaced persons problem. Why are the British so adamantly opposed to Jewish immigration to Palestine then? And what and what's their what is the British end game in Palestine? <laughs> I wonder what you think about that. I don't know. I mean you probably know as well as I. I I've tried you know you you try to figure it out. And the the British have lost their empire. I mean, they've lost India. They are now a third-rate power at best. They want to retain influence somewhere. And they think the best place to maintain their, their standing and to maintain their economic ties to oil-rich Arab nations is to 
sacrifice the Jews. I mean, in the end, who's more important to the British? A handful of Jews or the Arab rich potent, the oil rich potentates, you know, and they're not gonna get in their way. There's this, there's this moment in which Truman says to the British, Tr Truman believes that he can somehow persuade the British to open their doors to the Jewish refugees. And at some point he writes, he said, you know, there, there's no longer a problem of millions of European Jews taking over Palestine. He said, you know, Hitler killed most of them. He said, we're not talking about millions, we're talking about 100,000. You go into some depth in the book about, uh, you know, the, the UN two-state solution uh, the Palestinian Arabs and, and uh, the Jewish DPs uh, creating a, a Zionist state and, and all the complexities of that in, against the backdrop of, um, you know, the, the DPs in Europe and how they're getting there. And then how the Truman administration is face to face with this. And you've got an interesting dynamic because the British, as we've explored, are so adamantly opposed and, and you know, certainly anti-Semitic in some respects. But they're also kind of saying to the Americans, well, if you feel so strongly about this, why don't you just open your doors to the Jews? Yeah. And the Americans are kind of like, yeah. oh, no, 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 we're not talking about that. Palestine is, why can't we make that happen? And it, it's, you really explore this dynamic, I think, very well. So, how, so like, how is Truman dealing with this? What, well, where does Truman, this lead for him? You know, the, the State Department, Truman, doesn't get along with the State Department. The State Department, <laughs> on like the second day after he becomes president, the State Department comes to visit him. And the State Department, I don't know whether it's Titania, who, who it is, and they say, stay out of anything having to do with the Jews in Palestine. Um, just leave it to us. And Truman is furious, absolutely furious. And the next day he meets with Stephen Wise, the chief rabbi, one of the chief rabbis in, in the United States. And Truman believes that he has the leverage to force the British to open up Palestine. And he does have leverage. The, the British need a huge loan to survive the immediate post-war period. Um, and Truman could have said, open Palestine, you'll get the loan, but he doesn't do it. And he doesn't do it because he knows that in the United States as well, the United States has just won a war and it's been a deadly, dreadful war. And Truman knows there is no way he can get through Congress an emergency immigration law that's gonna let in any displaced persons. When he realizes by 1948 that the British aren't gonna open up Palestine as long as they hold the mandate and that the Americans aren't gonna let them in. And if the Americans don't let the Jews in, the Canadians and the Argentinians and the Brazilians and the Australians won't, he, he's gotta get a quarter million Jews out of Germany. He can't establish a West German independent country with a quarter million Jews behind barbed wire. And where's he gonna put them? The only place is Palestine. And he and supports the UN partition resolution. And then when Israel declares independence, I think it's six minutes afterwards or three minutes afterwards, the Americans recognize the, the state of Palestine. Yeah, and in, and of course, in the meantime, um, you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of people still in DP camps back in Germany, Jews and otherwise, and you go into to great detail in the book on what these camps are like and the political dynamics among the various groups, of course, besides the Jews, there were other DPs who didn't want to go home. So what are their living conditions like and why don't many of them want to go home? The largest group of the Poles and they don't want to go home for two reasons. There are a lot of the, most of the Poles had come to Germany as teenagers. They had been conscripted labor, forced labor. And they had lived a good chunk of their lives now in Germany. And they knew that the country they had been part of 
their towns, their villages, their farmlands had been destroyed during the war. And they were told over and over again, there are two reasons. And they were told by the Polish, mostly the Polish army, um, veterans who were in the camps with them. They were told, don't go back to Poland. One, because it's been devastated. And two, because the Soviets have taken over. If you are a true Pole, a true Pole, you will live your life in exile, doing everything you possibly can to free Poland. And so then this becomes um, an emblem of tension in the, the beginning Cold War now, you know, yeah. between the, the, the West and the Soviets. Yeah. And so that's a big, obviously, theme in your book is the beginnings of the Cold War and its impact on, on the last million. The Soviets and the Soviet-dominated Polish government and the Yugoslav government and the Czech government, they all say to the Americans, why in God's name are you sheltering our nationals in camps in Germany? The only people who are in camps are those who were too lazy to come back to Poland or to Belarus or to Yugoslavia and rebuild their nation, or they were complicit. They were Nazi sympathizers and they don't wanna go back to Poland or to Lithuania or Latvia because they'll be tried for war crimes. Um, and the Americans say, no, no, we're not sending anybody back. Not only are we not sending anybody back, but we're gonna feed and we're gonna shelter them. And if they decide not to go back, we're gonna find another place in the world for them. And, and the Soviets say over and over again, and the Soviets are half right. They say to the Americans and the British, don't you know that there are collaborators, there are war criminals, there are members of the Waffen SS from Latvia and the Ukraine and Estonia hiding in these camps, these collaborators disguise themselves as displaced persons and they end up in the United States and in Canada and in Britain and in Australia. We will never know how many thousands of war criminals from Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, parts of Russia, Yugoslavia, Croatia, Romania end up in the United States. From yeah. 1945. Some, you know, with the help of the CIA and the military, others because they fall through the cracks. They, they definitely fall through the cracks. And that, that was, I think, in some ways, one of the most tragic elements of your book and, and some of the most disillusioning aspects of the book is how many perpetrators do end up in the West, in the United States, um, making lives for themselves. And I, one of the things that, that occurred to me as I, I read the book is I thought this is really important reading to understand for, for anybody who's up on current events. You know, you wake up and there's a news story about how some Ukrainian camp guard or something, how he's been apprehended by federal marshals and sent back for trial because he was a perpetrator. And, and of course, in popular culture, what we think of a, a Holocaust perpetrator is a hardcore SS guy who's German and doing his thing. And so I think for somebody who's, as many Americans are, sort of reading stories like that and wondering, what's the backdrop of that? You could really get a full understanding of that in yeah. your book. You know, the, the transition from World War to Cold War is almost seamless. And it happens much more rapidly than, than we ever imagined. And by 1948, you know, the INS and the FBI and the CIA and Congress, they're, they're looking the other way. They, they don't want to ferret out these, these Nazi sympathizers. Why? Because what's important now is that these Nazi sympathizers are anti-communist and some of them anti-communist activists. And why not bring a Ukrainian colonel into the United States? Why not bring a Latvian? Why not bring a member of the Iron Guard, the Romanian Iron Guard, um, into the United States and have them organize 
fellow Romanians against the Soviet Union. The world war is over. We won. Let's, you know, let's let bygones be bygones. We know the Nazis were terrible, but we have a new enemy now. Um, and I, I found that absolutely tragic and disgraceful that the crimes of the Nazi regime were so quickly forgotten in the immediate Cold War period. It takes another generation, really. Yeah. It takes the Eichmann trial and the Anne Frank book until Americans once again understand and set out to punish the Nazi collaborators among them. Yeah, and then in some respects, it's too late to bring yeah. some to justice or whatever. Yeah. You know, one thing, one of the points I wanted to make is that, of course, this this story of displaced persons as a result of conflict or whatever is not just some sort of, you know, esoteric thing from 80, 70, 60 years ago. Uh, it's an ongoing phenomenon. Um, you know, so, for instance, I mean, it, it, this era of Afghan refugees and Syrian refugees, you know, what sort of lessons do you think we can learn from the experience of Europe's post-war DPs and their various odysseys that, that might help us deal with this issue today? Yeah, number one, um, it's a global issue. It's an international issue and no one nation can, can solve it. That doesn't mean the Americans can run away, but the Americans have to work with other nations as we seem to be under this administration to solve the problem. Number two, we have to operate on hope rather than fear. Mark my words, in the next weeks and months, there is gonna be a backlash against Afghan refugees because the claim is gonna be made that the Taliban and ISIS are sneaking into the United States terrorists. Now that might be true, but American intelligence is not dumb. And if they want to look and if they want to search, they can weed out those people before they get here. So whatever refugee policy we come up with has to be based on facts on the ground, not on contrived fears. Um, and then we have to remember our heritage as a nation. You know, we have to recognize our better nature, that we have to operate out of humanitarian concerns. The book is derived from just a, an amazing blend of, of research, but some of which were first person interviews. So I, I can't help but, but wonder, you know, how you were personally affected by this sort of research journey in writing this book. What I had to do was to separate myself. What, what I had to do was to try to put away the research and put away the, the book and try to lead my life. It didn't always work. And the ones who suffer are one's family. Um, my wife, you know, my grown children, my friends, um, I don't know how many uh, dinner parties I dominated because I was just so filled with rage, with mm -hmm. this, this sense of tragedy. So yeah, it, it, you can't write about something like this and, and not be affected on a daily basis. But if you're too affected, then you can't write history as it happened. So you, you've got to maintain that balance. And I try. Yeah. Yeah, there has to be that objectivity in the end, so yeah. much as you can do that, and a little bit of a distance, but boy, it's a, it's a challenge figuring out where that actual line is, yeah. Well, David, it's been just such an incredible honor and pleasure to, to talk with you today. Congratulations on the book, again. Um, I, I highly recommend it, and it's uh, it's been great to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you.